dictator Muammar Gaddafi ruled Libya for more than 40 years. But when the end came, it was fast. In 2011, the people rose up in mass protests. Rebels killed Gaddafi. The dictator was gone. But the country has been in chaos ever since. Fragmentation is the best single word to describe what's happening in Libya. A large number of actors and communities and groups all effectively competing against each other. Militias, extremists, and many international powers are ripping the country apart. And there are even two rival administrations, each claiming they should be in control. So how did things get so bad and so complicated in Libya? Let us unpack that for you. First, let's take a look at the bigger picture and what's at stake. Libya has a long coastline right at the doorstep of the European Union. This has made it a major stepping stone for people looking for refuge or a better life in the wealthy north. The governance chasm in Libya has enabled you know, the, the rapid growth of things like human smuggling through the country. We've seen, of course, that this can allow a breeding ground for uh, extremist groups. Libya is also home to Africa's biggest oil reserves, and this puts it on the radar of other countries. Any disruption of the energy supply coming from Libya are also important uh, for, for Europe, but also uh, because it constitutes the, the door to Africa to some extent. So the country, if the situation was better, uh, could also play an important role as a platform uh, between Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and possibly further. And most importantly, there are six million Libyan people desperate for a safe, secure future. Thousands have been killed in the fighting. Hundreds of thousands have been displaced from their homes. And more than a million need humanitarian aid. We can trace the roots of this situation all the way back to 2011. The popular protests known as the Arab Spring swept through the region. Dictators fell like dominoes and Libya's strongman Gaddafi was no exception. But the way he ruled made Libya ill-equipped to get back on its feet. What Gaddafi operationalized as a system is a divide and rule system to dilute the relevance of anyone he would deem or any faction he would deem potentially uh, a political military opponent, either by purging them or kind of marginalizing them from his patronage network. He used both his tribal uh, knowledge and his uh, tribal skills, but he, is, he also used religion uh, as well to control the, 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 the population. Once Gaddafi was gone, tribes and militias, which had united to get rid of him, turned against each other. In 2014, a disputed election plunged Libya into the abyss. Key civilian institutions like law enforcement and the judiciary collapsed. But as we heard earlier, two rival administrations emerged, both claiming to be the real legitimate government. There is a legitimacy vacuum in Libya. All of the institutions or the governments that exist today have had their mandates expire a long time ago. The only reason that these institutions or these political classes or political leaders exist today is because of circumstances. It's because of the failure of the democratic transition. What makes it even worse? The country sits on the division line of a fundamental rivalry that runs through the entire region. Competition for power inside Libya uh, between domestic players uh, extended uh, regionally and more internationally. We could also see in this confrontation between the two camps two different models of power competing in the post-Arab Spring era, if you can say. A division between what was called at the time 
uh, the Islamist camp versus the others uh, that could be described as nationalist, um, more military oriented, etc. Two broad but distinct models of power, one largely based on political Islam and the other largely based on militarist nationalism. And here's how that's played out in Libya. The side considered to be part of the militarist nationalist camp is the House of Representatives and General Khalifa Haftar. He leads what he calls the Libyan National Army or LNA and is based in the eastern city of Tobruk. The LNA is supported by Russia, Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Egypt. Egypt shares a long border with Libya and sees Haftar and his LNA as the best way to prevent extremist attacks spilling over that border. Along with the UAE and Saudi Arabia, Egypt also sees Haftar as a bulwark against the spread of Islamic groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, which they consider a terror organization. On the one hand, you have those regional and international actors that have come to the conclusion or to the idea that uh, there's a, a need for a strong man that could contribute to restore authority. And so for them, stability, authority, and even uh, military authority are perceived as the priority. On the other side, you have the UN-recognized Government of National Accord, or GNA. It's considered to be part of the political Islam camp, is led by Prime Minister Fayez Sarraj, and is based in the capital Tripoli. The GNA's international backers include Qatar and Turkey. Turkey wants drilling rights in the Mediterranean, but also has a shared ideological framework with the GNA, namely political Islam and support for the Muslim Brotherhood across the region. The coalition that has brought together the GNA, Turkey, Qatar, represents an attempt to bring together those uh, forces that have opposed military rule. Some Islamist element and political Islam has also been an important component, but not the only one. You also have European countries like France and Italy backing opposing sides, each saying they want stability in the region. But regardless of intention, all of this has led to a feeling that this isn't really about Libyans and their future. Sometimes uh, people question whether what we have in Libya is actually a civil war or an international war that's being fought on Libyan uh, soil and in Libyan skies. The rivalry between the two administrations reached ahead in 2019, when Haftar tried but failed to conquer Tripoli. The country has been at a chaotic impasse ever since. International focus is often on Libya's fate as a battleground for a regional proxy warfare. Many Libyan people feel they don't have a seat at the table. We have now gotten to a point where what Libyans think or what the aspirations of the Libyans people are have become irrelevant because of the level of foreign interference in this country. Meanwhile, daily life in Libya is hard and is getting worse. I have family there, I have friends there, uh, located in all the geographic sides of the country and under, under both the administrations. I wouldn't say that they want specifically the same thing, uh, institutionally speaking, uh, or that they have the same views over legitimacy, but mostly what Libyan people want is roughly what every kind of citizen in this world wants good governance, uh, sustainable authorities, employment opportunities, um, some freedom of expression. They overthrew the regime before. If neither of the two administrations which claim legitimacy improved their lives, might the Libyan people have the courage to challenge both of them? We have seen some genuine videos of mothers of young people coming out on the streets and airing these grievances of deteriorating living conditions, of insecurity, of young people being taken to war or leaving the country on boats to Europe. This is an indication that people or, or, or the citizens might have a certain threshold. If that is crossed, then they will come out on the streets. 